but the storytelling industries like filmmakers, you seem to have a, a different business model than the, than the business model of the technology people. And I'm wondering if you can comment about that, because I have a suspicion that the business model that the storytellers use may begin to inform the business model for the traditional business technology development. Exactly. Because that's the future of now. Okay. And, and here's, okay, I've, I've actually helped um, start seven startup companies in tech, tech startups since 2000. I've helped raise $10 million. I used to advise VCs at DataQuest, so I know how VCs think. Um, and I've pitched, you know, with the, the, the programmers. I work with engineers and programmers a lot. And, and um, so I know how to pitch VCs and angels for tech startups, okay? And we know the, the drill, the business plan, the pitch, you know, okay? which you're all pretty familiar with probably. Um, and I've also helped raise about half a million dollars for two productions, PBS, and then the other one was a, uh, well, one, a British television. Okay? They're slightly different, but they're, they're converging, and here's why. Um, technology actually hit it first. In the past, technology, you sold technology now because there's so much, it's commodity in many cases, there's too much competition. You have to think of your end use market first, so you have to be really market driven, and so you have to write your business plan and do your technology based on what the market wants, right? And that kind of changed during the 90s because of the competition coming in from Japan and Asia. The same thing is true in filmmaking. In the past, you used to make your own movie, but now distribution's clogged because there are 1,000, you know, 80,000, no, something like 80,000 short movies made every year, right? There's a glut. So unless you target your end use market first, you will never succeed because you can't do a wide role. You have to focus in. So high tech and independent filmmaking in particular, not the Hollywood stuff because they've got billions of dollars to do things, but both startups and high tech everything, need to focus on niches and they both need to develop communities around it, i.e. your fan club, your users. And if you don't do that, you will not survive because you know, in both cases, when you pitch, pitch the VCs, the first thing is that who's using it, what are they willing to play, what's the business model? Is, have you validated the business model? If you don't have customers and you haven't validated the business model, no money. And even if you don't go to VC, you're out of business if you have no customers, right? Movies are the same now. If you don't have a target audience and distribution channels figured out in advance, you make it and it sits on the shelf. You might as well just do, do, do it for your mother and father, basically. So the two models are emerging. Now, the interesting thing is Lucas actually pioneered the first convergence model. If you think about it, Lucas Films was the storytelling, right? And ILM was the tech side. And he, he knew that you needed both to tell the stories because, you know, this is cheaper and faster, or you could do more amazing things, you know, with technology. Universal Pictures, just one of the senior VPs came about oh, five years ago to Stanford Business School, and then they asked the same question. He goes, one kid said, hey, I want to go into Hollywood and movies and all that. What do I do? And he said, stay right here. The future of, Silicon Val of Hollywood is in Silicon Valley because you people control the technology and increasingly the distribution channels. Because as you know, Amazon, Google, Facebook are all coming in and doing, you know, video streaming and distribution. They are the new studios. We just don't realize it yet. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, as we move away, because HP found that out, right? They tried to sell hardware, going to get killed by the Chinese. Now, IBM knew a long time ago, the services and content, right? Consulting, if you want margins, that's the future of the valley. All the hardware is going to go offshore. It's just cheaper. So you're going to have to look more like IBM consulting services and content, and you better tell a good story because you're going against everybody else in town too, right? You're competing for their attention. So marketing and storytelling, and I'll be frank, it's in the past you used to sell to military boys and Pentagon and, you know, enterprise, critical, mission critical. They didn't care. They said, give me the price, price performance, right? Hardcore. Nowadays, you know what the driver is? It's consumer. And it's not your consumer down the street. It's a 50-year-old woman in India or Africa or Latin America, and you're selling to her, not to some Pentagon guy who's seen it all. And if you don't tell a good story to that woman, you're out of business. Apple Computer and HP and all those people are going to find that out. So it, we're moving away from hardware, basically, mission critical, to consumer, and that's driven by woman, uh, about 80% probably. And if you don't understand woman, 
especially third world countries, you have no future. Okay? And that's kind of where I see it going. And so the valley hasn't woken up yet. We, we will make up. We will wake up. Um, but we have the ability to pull it off. Just because you're like me, a guy who grew up in the Valley of Hardware, doesn't mean you can't go international and, and work with women. You just partner with them. Again, the trend that I'm seeing, um, personally from the filmmakers in particular, the documentary filmmakers, um, it is kind of, I think, what a lot of you are tending to go towards as well. It's, it's convergence, it's hybrid. Um, the thing, I was talking to several of them, and they said, you know, we know how to get grants for films. We know, we know the drill. You know, we know the nonprofit route. Um, what we really need is funding for social media. And beyond uh, marketing and, and things like that, which obviously is free, and obvi but at the same time, you know, we definitely learned that um, you definitely still need a social media strategist. Um, the, the algorithms and things like that are, are sophisticated enough where just because you're on Facebook doesn't mean, you know, you can necessarily uh, pull that off. But uh, at the same time, they, um, they said, look, you know, we, we can do the marketing and such, but we actually want to do these transmedia projects that go with our films. So the gaming, the, the iPhone apps, you know, things like that. And in particular gaming, we have found, because having seen pitches from a lot of filmmakers, uh, you know, especially in Hollywood and around the country, the, the, there are several that have been gamers that have come, and um, they, they're the ones making the money. You know, they have a niche that is already there. And uh, in particular, there's a company in Palo Alto that um, isn't Second Life, but it's kind of the next generation of that. And I was talking to them about when you were talking about the, the actual the, the, the uh, women, I guess, in particular, and how some of these games um, are actually influencing um, the world. Uh, you've gone on Second Life, uh, folks that are Vietnam vets, or they're maybe vets of the Afghan war, who they're allowed to go to a dance, you know, there, um, and yet they can't dance in person. Um, wow. Different things like that that are just huge. There's a lot of things that are happening there that are, don't, you know, are virtual, but they're real for these people. Um, and at the same time, you have, um, you know, folks uh, in the Middle East, for example, and Qatar and places like this where the women uh, they're saying are their biggest customers, and it's because they can uh, they can't go out in public. They're they're not allowed to, and so they're able to be an avatar, and they're able to wear whatever they want, and they're able to connect with even other women around the world, or you know find a date online and things like that. And yet these people are paying real money to do this. So so the real money is being made right now there. And so if you can somehow uh, get an educational game or something like that to to help with your whatever you're doing, uh, that, can make, that can make money. What's it, so what's that company you said in Palo Alto? Um, IMVU. IMVU. Is, uh, IMVU. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, one thing I always think about, I'm, I was a data quest, I always go where the markets are, the money is, take your pick, right? And, and there's two pots of cash that nobody's figured out yet, okay? And it's controlled by women. I was in Saudi Arabia in Riyadh teaching entrepreneurship, you know, in the King Saud University. And I was talking to all these young, all guys, because it was, a, well, as you know, men's university and women's universities, right? And you're building equal number of both. That was interesting. So one of the comments, the guy goes, oh, yeah, you know, my, our families are big, and, you know, the women control everything at home. And I was going, yeah, it sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it. Can you believe this? He said, yeah. One fourth of all assets in the Saudi economy is owned by women, controlled. I said, "That's a lot of money." He goes, "Yes, they can get whatever they want." And then when I was there, they said there are all these women's, you know, business associations setting up and small business because governments try to privatize, right? And then I met some people, and he said, "Oh, by the way, Sharon," he goes, "Do you think there's any Silicon Valley woman who want to partner with this Saudi woman?" I said, uh, "Yeah, it's because." The market's big and booming because they have like eight, seven or eight kids each, right? And they have a lot of money, right? So that's one market, for example, that nobody ever looks at totally. And it's two split markets, but it's, you know, big. The other one in which I, it kind of fell off a chair, I was looking at The Economist, and it said um, five years ago the Japanese woman controlled, well, the Japanese savers is controlled by women. Had $16 trillion in assets. It's $16 trillion. The Chinese sovereign fund only has two point. Seven trillion, and then by the way, the yen went up twenty percent, and so it's now worth like twenty-one, twenty-two trillion trillion dollars, and it's controlled by the woman. The men ran the government and went bankrupt. <laughs> the woman said, "We kept it and we saved it." 
so nobody's ever tapped that. Right? But they control it. So all I'm saying is that as you move toward consumer markets, you watch for who makes the decisions because that will tell you what kind of products you should probably develop and who you should be talking to because I'm a market researcher. Always talk to the buyer, i.e. the decision maker. My, my daughter said it best. She used to say, yeah, dad's the leader of the house. Mom is, makes the final decisions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she power the purse. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of one thing I've observed you know, over the last couple of years. Is that, and if you look at each country, you'll see the same thing happening as we move more from an, an, just only industrial to more of a uh, middle class consumer. China is exploding right now. Just exploding. Talk to any Chinese and they'll say half the time, the wife controls it all. Same thing. Right? So I think there's a lot of areas where we need to kind of re, re uh, kind of reevaluate the way we see the world because the, the balance of power and money is shifting pretty quickly and and, and that's the future of Silicon Valley because we're global right? we're not just focusing here